Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video 31. This is on gene regulation. In other words, how we express a gene or not. How we make a protein or not. And I want to start with an organism that lives in our intestine called E. coli. Uh, e. coli is interesting in that it eats whatever we eat. And so if I eat bacon for breakfast, it has to break down the proteins and the lipids in the bacon. If I have cereal, it has to break down the carbohydrates. Um, if I have milk, it has to break down the lactose. And so what's interesting about an E. coli is that it can go from an organism that has zero proteins to break down lactose to one where 50% of the weight of E. coli is simply enzymes that deal with lactose. And it can do it like that. And so how do they do that? They do that through gene regulation. And so in this podcast, I'm going to talk about gene regulation. Before I do that, I want to get some terminology that I'm going to use a lot out of the way. And so a regulatory gene is going to be a gene on the DNA that regulates uh, another gene somewhere farther down. A regulatory sequence will usually be found just above the gene. And so what do I mean by that? So if DNA looks like this, the gene generally will be down here that we want to express or not. Um, a regulatory gene will be somewhere else in the DNA. It secretes something called a regulatory protein, which then can grab onto a regulatory sequence. An example to, of a regulatory sequence I'll talk about is, is called a promoter. Um, once this is all fit up, then we can have an RNA polymerase actually make the gene. And so I'll go through that terminology, but when I'm talking about regulatory gene, regulatory sequence, um, those both deal with DNA, but when I'm talking about a regulatory protein, that's coming from somewhere else to uh, help express the gene or not. Uh, as far as gene regulation examples, most of what we know now comes from bacteria. And so I'll talk about positive and negative control. Positive control example I'll give you is the LAC operon. That deals with lactose. And the negative control is the TRIP operon. deals with tryptophan. And then finally, I'll show you what we know about eukaryotic gene regulation and how they use transcription factors as activators, repressors to either express a gene or not. And so um, this is how genes are made or expressed, remember. We start with uh, DNA, and that DNA eventually makes messenger RNA, which eventually makes proteins, and those eventually make you. And so any step along the way, we can actually um, regulate the gene. So we can regulate it post-translationally, post-transcriptionally, so we can do it everywhere. But in general, most of the regulation I'm talking about is just going to be from DNA to messenger RNA. Do we express the gene or do we not? And so this is generally what goes on. We've got a gene like this, Upstream of that, we have a regulatory sequence. An example of this in eukaryotes would be the TATA box. And the reason it's called the TATA box is you have a thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. And on the other side, you'd have TATA backwards, um, complementary to that. And so this is simply a sequence above the gene that allows the RNA polymerase to get on. And so we have a regulatory protein coming from somewhere else, remember, another regulatory gene, maybe downstream or upstream from this whole gene. The regulatory protein, an example, could be the TATA binding protein. This is found in us. It'll grab onto the TATA box. Let me get rid of the writing. And it allows RNA polymerase to grab on and actually express that gene. And so if we didn't have the sequence, if we didn't have the regulatory protein, we couldn't make the RNA polymerase and we couldn't make the protein. And so that's basically how uh, genes are regulated or not. And so let's talk about how this works in the LAC operon in bacteria because this is the first one that we really started to understand. So the way they, they tweak what I just said is that the neat thing about bacteria is instead of just having one gene, they'll have a number of genes. And so they'll have three genes. All the genes required to deal with lactose will be put right next to each other. And so we've named those the LAC, Z, Y, and A gene, but they each make a protein and they each help break down lactose. Above that, they'll have a regulatory sequence called a promoter. Remember, that's going to be where RNA polymerase grabs on. And the other thing they'll have in an op operon is called an operator. An operator sits right between the promoter and the genes. And the way I like to think about it is it's like an on-off switch. And so it can either be set in an on position or it can be set in an off position. And so it regulates whether or not we turn the genes on or we don't. 
The other thing that I'm going to add here is something called a repressor. A repressor will plug right into the operator, so it's going to fit right here. And as long as the repressor is available, RNA polymerase can't get on. And so this would be, when the presser is here, the operator is now in the off position. In other words, we can't make these genes. This repressor I'm going to show you is, is showing what's called positive control. And what do we mean by positive control? What I said was when lactose shows up, we want to make all the proteins to break down and deal with lactose. And right now there's no lactose present, and so it's off. But let's say lactose shows up. In other words, I drink a glass of milk. Now there's lactose. So the lactose shows up. The lactose, you'll notice, is going to fit perfectly into that repressor. And when it fits in the repressor, it changes the conformation or the shape of that protein. In other words, now the repressor doesn't fit in the operator anymore. In other words, it lacks these um, little prongs, we'll say, that fit in the operator. Okay, so lactose is present, repressor is now off. Well, who can grab on? RNA polymerase now fits. RNA polymerase can fit. There's no repressor. RNA polymerase is going to run down. It's going to make each of the messenger RNAs for each of those LAC genes. Each of those are going to make a protein. And each of those are going to break down the lactose. And so we can deal with the lactose and we can metabolize that lactose. So now the lactose is gone. What's happening to our repressor? It's going back to that original shape. And so it's a cool way we can have positive control. If lactose shows up, then we make, down, make all the proteins that can actually deal with that lactose. Shows up again, we're going to get rid of that repressor, and we continue. And so that would be positive control. What's an example of negative control? Well, a negative control we learned about from the trip operon. Trip operon, instead of having just three, it actually has five different genes, but they're put right next to each other in the same way. Um, the way it works is it's actually off when tryptophan or whenever that chemical is present. And so tryptophan, remember, is an amino acid. We need it to make proteins. And so bacteria, as long as tryptophan is present, they don't want to have to make tryptophan on their own. And so the way it works here is that the actual tryptophan fits in the repressor. It gives it a shape that actually blocks the uh, RNA polymerase or the making of those proteins. But let's say, for example, that your diet doesn't have tryptophan, so you're not getting tryptophan in your diet. What does the bacteria do? Well, now the repressor is going to change shape. It's going to change shape. That allows RNA polymerase on. RNA polymerase is going to quickly make those five proteins, and then those five proteins are going to make more tryptophan. So the tryptophan fits again, and it's going to turn off. And so what that gives us is really cool control as far as a bacteria goes on if we have positive control in the case of lactose whenever it shows up, then we want to break it down, or tryptophan control, negative control when it's, when it's there, then we want to turn it off. So simple, neat engineering solution to a, a real world problem. Now we don't have operons. Remember in between each of our genes we'll have long stretches where there's actually junk quote unquote DNA. And so the way it works in us is a little bit different. We use what are called transcription factors. So RNA polymerase is here but RNA polymerase can't get on until we have a number of transcription factors present. And so let's say we want to make a protein as well in eukaryotes. To do that we have uh, regulatory factors. Those are actually made by regulatory genes. They could be somewhere else in the DNA or they could even be outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. So in order for us to transcribe a gene, it takes a little bit more, uh, it's a little more in depth. First of all, the transcription factors will allow the attachment of RNA polymerase. We'll have other transcription factors that will actually hold it in place but you can see that we're not actually making the gene. And so uh, in order to make the gene, the DNA upstream of that will actually have to fold. It'll get more transcription factors, and you'll notice that still nothing's going on. We still don't have transcription until that actually folds back and activates that RNA polymerase. Can it go now and make that protein uh, or make the RNA and then eventually make the, the protein. And so how does it work in us? We don't really have these on-off switches. I don't know if you can see my hands. Um, but what happens is the DNA actually folds back on itself.
and it can activate genes in other places along the genome. And so it's uh, a different form of control, it's a more complex form of control, but it really requires input from all these other transcription factors. So that's gene regulation, and I hope that's helpful.